it's almost five after. So I think we may start. Uh, this is an informational meeting only. It's now about five after three. This is the meeting of the board. Um, the continuation of our agenda that we had last Wednesday, we're going to hear reports from the presidents of the colleges. Um, they have restart reports and restart plans. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important for us to know that that we did talk about last week about approving these, but we have decided that because these are living documents and there's changes coming in literally almost every day, that we need to um, give some flexibility to the presidents and to the administration to uh, to adapt as the situation uh, is, is needed. Uh, many common elements of these plans, but they're all just a slightly bit different because they're all different institutions with different kind of academic needs. So I guess I'll get started here. And um, Sophie, do you want to start off with any comments on this to start with before we move to the presidents? Sure. Um, so, I mean, there is no sort of perfect solution to, to what we're dealing with. Um, so I think that needs to be acknowledged. There's no simple answer. If there was, all the colleges across the country would be doing exactly the same thing. Um, there are disadvantages to not bringing students back, um, You know, particularly those students that are housing insecure, have mental health challenges, or have no reliable access uh, to broadband uh, internet, and some you know, whose home life is not conducive to them learning remotely. So. Um, and I think at this particular time, you know, we want to be, be sensitive to inequities between students. And so I think it's important that we have uh, the ability to bring students back uh, that need to be um, on the campuses in order to learn. Uh, so we do recognize, obviously, there's pushback going on around the country with respect to, to reopening plans. Uh, I would want to point out, though, that in Vermont, we are having a somewhat of a different experience here, given... Uh, what our experience with the virus has been and, you know, the conservative approach that the governor has taken, the compliance generally uh, across the population and the low incident rates. Um, so I think of, of all states that, that could be prepared to welcome student back, students back, Vermont's probably in one of the better positions to do that. Uh, we do have guidance from the governor. We have guidance from the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and we're following those uh, closely. And as, as those evolve, again, Lynn referenced the uh, living document concept, but as the situation changes or the guidance changes, uh, changes will then be made to, uh, to the policies. Uh, the colleges have developed robust um, procedures to deal with students uh, returning, both testing procedures, quarantining procedures, isolation procedures, uh, and I'll let them talk more about that. Um, obviously for us, we're a little different than some of the other colleges and universities in the state of Vermont in that most of our students are Vermonters. So they've already been, you know, subject to the, the restrictions in Vermont um, and, and, you know, have had a good experience uh, so far with the, with the virus. Um, our presidents and their senior leadership teams have been in touch with their local communities, their select boards, town managers, et cetera, to bring them up to speed on what they're doing. Um, we've been working with our faculty and staff to address concerns that they may have regarding returning to the classroom and accommodating where we can um, so that people that are, are uncomfortable have, have uh, health conditions or whatever that are causing them concern about returning, making accommodations for that, um, being able to teach remotely or work remotely. Obviously, that's not possible for everybody. Some people's jobs physically require them to be on campus, but we are working with faculty and staff uh, to address those concerns as best we can. Uh, I know the colleges are working hard to create a culture of compliance and um, you know, to, to be very, very clear how important this is. Students are being asked to sign pledges. Uh, there's a commitment to discipline um, and make clear that, that um, you know, half-heartedly following them or being casual about following the rules is not gonna be acceptable. And um, I think everyone understands that their safety sort of relies on everybody else following the rules as well, that this is not a time to be selfish, but everyone has to work together um, to be, to, you know, for this to be successful. Uh, we have uh, talked about hiring. There are some significant um, administrative burdens with meeting all the guidance. Um, I know at least one of our colleges has already hired someone to assist with that. And I think our other residential colleges will be moving in that direction too, to make sure that we are 
in a position administratively to comply with the requirements. Um, I think, again, you've already noted, but the situation is continuing to evolve and unfold. And so we just have to be flexible and respond um, as it does so. So that, those were sort of more my general statements. Uh, we did provide the, the trustees and it's part of the board materials, um, a summary of where all the colleges fall on particular key issues. I understand that some of the links weren't working in that, but we'll make sure that we've got an updated one with all, all the links working. Um, and we'll put that with the board materials when they get posted on the website. Um, we know nothing is risk-free um, and uh, the reality is, and we've been told this by the Department of Health, there will be positive cases. The test is gonna be how well do we manage those and make sure that we avoid an outbreak. Um, but the expectation is that you know there will be positive cases. We just have to make sure we catch them and that uh, you know those that have a positive are quarantined and isolated so that there isn't an outbreak as a result. And with that, I'm, I'm happy for, to step aside and let the, uh, the presidents discuss their plans. I don't know if you have a preferred order uh, that you want to call on the, the presidents, uh, Chair Dickinson. Well, I was thinking maybe reverse order alphabetically. We always <laughs> seem to start with... As, as a Dadatni, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why don't we call on uh, President Moulton of VTC? Thank you, Chair Dickinson. Why did I know I'd be first today? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's probably appropriate because we did have our first positive test of a student last Friday. So um, I will just discuss generally where we are. Um, we are opening in a hybrid model this fall, meaning all our lectures will be done remotely and students will come in for low residency weeks to do their lab and uh, other hands-on applied. And this is driven by so much of our curriculum has to involve practical hands-on applied learning. It's tough to learn to be a nurse and not actually give someone an injection or learn to fix a diesel truck or a car without actually putting your hands in more and, and, and so on and so on. Classes start for us on August 24th. We'll have no breaks this semester and students will leave and go home at Thanksgiving and finish the semester remotely. We will have approximately, the students will come for approximately three lab weeks total, staggered throughout the semester. Um, there will be different students during those lab weeks. Um, we have offered full semester housing to our out-of-state students, uh, students who may uh, have challenging uh, learning environments at home or may be technically challenged, or those who absolutely need to be here for access to clinic regularly, such as our dental hygiene students, our professional pilot students that need to be near the airport, our, our veterinary techni technician students, our agricultural students, et cetera. We anticipate we'll have approximately 100, 100 uh, all semester long residents here in Randolph Center and about 28 in Williston. We're putting them all in single class, single rooms, so they are by themselves. Um, they will be in two dorms approximately where we will try to have would not try. We will have our permanent semester students in one part of the dorm and our commuter students who may be coming in for multiple nights during lab weeks in another part of the dorm. So they'll be somewhat isolated from each other. Every student, we are requiring every student to have a test prior to coming to campus. The out-of-state students had to send us a test before they came and then we tested them on day zero, which was last Wednesday, and we'll test them again day seven, which will be this zero. Uh, this Wednesday. The one student we had that had a positive test, sure enough, had a negative test he provided prior to coming to campus and then had a positive test five days later when we tested him on August 12th. He, uh, that student is in isolation as required and the other students on the floor of the positive tests are in quarantine. All students are quarantined, meaning they cannot leave campus, but the students on his floor are quarantined, meaning they cannot leave the building, uh, cannot leave their room. Um, this is until we can get tests done and or um, we confirm that um, there are no issues with symptoms. The student who tested positive is asymptomatic and feeling fine. Um, uh, as the summary says, I mean, we are. it's our plan to have that one test for our, that one testing protocol, the two times for our out-of-state students, and then ask all our Vermont students to test and provide us a, a negative test prior to coming to campus. 
we're still debating whether or not we're going to require students who come for res for lab weeks to get a test before each lab week. Um, if if we were to do that, we feel it's going to only be those students from any yellow or red counties in Vermont or elsewhere. So um, we may require they have those commuting students who are here for lab weeks to have up to three tests. Um, we are not requiring uh, tests for faculty and staff, but we are strongly encouraged that, that they do that. Uh, Gifford Hospital will provide testing and folks can make appointments whether they're symptomatic or not. We are doing the required health screening for everyone who comes to campus. We've been all summer long doing that via checking in with public safety, uh, getting their temperature checked, answering the questions and logging who came. We expect to have a lot more folks coming, mainly faculty for labs and to do recorded lectures or, or synchronous lectures. So the public safety route is going to be difficult. So we're moving to a self attestation model using Castle Branch software, which is, requires you to enter your temperature every day and answer the appropriate questions. Then we're also monitoring and um, that self attestation by doing random checks each week of a certain number of employees and a certain number of students and validating uh, did they in fact enter their data into Castle Branch. So we have that. Uh, we are requiring everyone to wear face coverings anytime they are out of their room. They're going to have to wear them in classes. They're going to have to wear them in the dining hall, except when they're eating. Um, and at this point, our dining is doing dining hall is doing grab and go. Um, so they're taking it back to their room. And, and if the dining hall were to open, we would be socially distanced and minimize the number of students in there at any one time. Uh, so face coverings are required, social distancing is required. I will say we are providing two masks or two face coverings to each student and uh, face coverings to all our employees. Um, social distancing, hand washing, et cetera, apply. Um, let's see, outside vendors are required still to uh, check in with public safety and get their temperature monitored and their safety and their questions answered. So that's regardless of what facility they're going to here on the Randolph campus and same in Williston. Oh, I should back up. We have isolation spaces identified on both campuses. We have a wing in Old Dorm here in Randolph Center, and we're actually going to put students in the fitness center in Williston um, because that has two private use bathrooms that and we have to uh, have isolation given the number of students for maybe three uh, in Williston. And it's we are required to provide isolation for 5% of those students in residence. Um, there was a discussion today on a call. The Association of Vermont Independent Colleges has invited us to weekly meetings of the presidents there. And there was some discussion about whether we would be required to isolate commuting stu students. And um, that answer is all over the map amongst Vermont colleges. At this time, we are not planning on isolating commuting students. Most of our commuters come from home, unlike UVM or Middlebury, where they have commuters in apartment buildings in and around their towns. We're, don't, we're not having that as much here in Randolph. We have that to some degree in Williston. Um, but they're again required to provide the initial test and do the self attestation. Um, outside visitors are not allowed in the dorm. Uh, we are not doing, or uh, residence halls rather, we are not doing any outside groups. We're closing our shape uh, gym facility to all but students and faculty and staff, students and employees, no, no general public. We're not holding events. Uh, we're not leasing spaces. It's all college direct activity. Um, athletics, we do plan on doing cross country and having competitions in a, in a controlled way, staggered release, time-based, et cetera. Uh, we are contemplating soccer, but that's not looking really good. Um, and when, if we were to do soccer, one of the conversations has been required testing and uh, we may not end up doing a co competitive soccer season, but more just conditioning and training. Our basketball team is, is arriving and they are just conditioning and training, no competitions and no out of state travel. Um, let's see. And yes, uh, all our students, out of state students are quarantining for the 14 days. Our um, commuting students will not be required to quarantine, but we're, and we are asking all our students to uh, sign a health pledge. And that's one of the links that wasn't working in the material you have, but um, Sophie has a corrected version now. Um, 
and we're also asking all our employees to sign a health pledge as well. Um, we've had the benefit, if you will, of the first positive case to, to uh, we were going to hold a tabletop exercise, but we had it in real time last Friday. Um, and found, uh, we, we learned a couple of things that I've shared with my colleagues that we weren't quite prepared for, but we're overall very pleased that we were prepared with the appropriate PPE, isolation rooms, personnel, um, and good and excellent contact and assistance from the Vermont Department of Health, which is doing all of our contract tracing for us uh, and seemingly happy, but their primary message was, this will not be your last positive. And um, not every positive means that actually you're going to have an outbreak. And that's what we're trying to control. So that's my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I'm debating whether we should have questions now or hear from the presidents first and then have questions for everyone. Is that satisfactory to the board? Yes. Okay, I would like to turn to Senator, Co oh, Senator. Uh, President Collins for Northern Vermont University. Please. Okay. That, that's, that's you, Elaine. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to see you. I, I've lost. Well, I can't see you. So can you see me? We can see you. All right. Then let me just go ahead. Uh, so as you know, we have opened uh, in a face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and fully online manner. Uh, we, similar to BTC, are also intending to not take any breaks this semester, but to go through and then release the students uh, at the time of think the Thanksgiving break. Uh, we are very pleased to report that thus far, with all the students that have taken the tests, as well as some of our staff and faculty, all of our tests have been negative. We are anticipating approximately 300 students on each of our campuses. Uh, and I really want to turn over much of the discussion to Jonathan Davis because he has been at the front lines of this effort. And um, I've been very pleased with my entire executive team. They've really taken on uh, just an amazing amount of work with what has been required to uh, launch a, a semester under these conditions in a safe way. Uh, just one point, again, unlike uh, VTC, Northern Vermont University has chosen to not utilize Castle Branch for our purposes. Uh, we found Castle Branch to be a little bit too invasive with the types of uh, process that they were requiring. So we chose to use a different uh, group that Jonathan will tell you all about. Um, and also, I just wanted to follow up something that was stated at the Wednesday meeting uh, last week, and that was a question kind of um, related to the type of testing we had, as you remember, contracted with the Broad Institute, and, uh, and we are having a very uh, positive experience with the Broad Institute. What I particularly like about them is that they are able to turn their tests around in just, uh, you know, a few days, almost, you know, like 24 to 72 hours. Uh, and and um, the question came up from the board, you know, is this like, is it a test that is giving kind of false positives and false negatives? I just wanted to point out that UBM is using the Broad Institute as well as Middlebury. So I think we are in good company. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan uh, so that he can give you more of the details. Jonathan? Uh, thanks, Elaine. Um, I, I want to just share for a moment, I, I spend a lot of my time these days clicking refresh on the results menu for the Broad Institute and waiting for the next set to come in. So that's how I spend my time these days. Um, and I'm happy to report that it's all been positive so far. So um, we have had our initial check-in. We started checking students in on the 9th. Uh, we had a staggered check-ins the 9th, the 13th, 14th, and 16th. So, um, and all those students um, have been tested and we have sent out communications to students who have not been tested that they will not be able to attend classes in person until they get that test. Our next big round of testing or day seven testing, if you will, will happen uh, this week on Thursday and Friday. We're preparing a communication to uh, invite our faculty and staff as well to participate in that round of testing. Um, the results have been coming back within 24 hours, happy to say, uh, mm -hmm. and that has been wonderful. We do understand that Broad is ramping up though uh, for increased uh, testing 
uh, with all of the larger schools. So we're curious to see if that increases at all to 36 hours perhaps, but so far so good. And the communication, if we need support has been amazing. So um, with the check-in, uh, we welcome students in staggered time blocks of uh, three time blocks per day, three hours each to have to check in. It was all drive-through testing with support from Linden Rescue and Newport Ambulance. They brought all the PPE necessary. That, that partnership has been awesome and we really appreciate their support. Um, we've given every student eye protection, multiple masks, hand sanitizer, and a thermometer if they don't have one already, as well as a lot of uh, information about the NVU pledge that they signed, as well as safety information about using a face mask, pro face mask properly, putting it on properly, taking it off properly, and of course, cleaning it. And, and when to use eye protection, when not to, et cetera. So lots of information. We hope that they're absorbing it, but we're spending a lot of time with them in a safe way to make sure they understand it and answering their questions. Um, so the students have just been wonderful. So far, uh, they are um, abiding by the pledge. They are putting their masks on. There have been some reminders here and there to both faculty staff, to all faculty staff and students, but for the most part, it's been wonderful. I just wanna say how excited they are to be back on campus, but the density is reduced. There are fewer of them. Uh, they all have single rooms in the, in the residence halls um, and they are very comfortable with that. And I, like I said, been, been asking some great questions. The students in quarantine that arrived, uh, we have about 30, uh, a little more than 30 students that are in quarantine right now. Um, and no doubt with the sun shining, they are eager to get out of there. Um, and uh, we may be with the right support and approval, we may be working on a way for them to uh, get outside in a fenced area um, to get a little bit of sunshine here. So they'll be testing on Thursday to get their second negative test before they move into housing that they were going to be assigned to in the fall. And all are cooperating, we're happy to report. Um, as, as, as President Collins mentioned, we are uh, going away from Castle Branch. I think Castle Branch is a terrific product, um, but I think part of the issue for us is not having enough time to do some of the workarounds that are necessary. For instance, two, two temperature checks per day um, and uh, other things uh, like the use of a social security number. There is a workaround for it, but we're going to utilize a web form through um, a platform called Formstack. Um, and we're gonna be tracking that weekly and doing spot checks, uh, monitoring every day for any symptoms by dumping that into a spreadsheet. And so uh, we had two students today, for example, uh, hit that they had fever, uh, but we, so we reached out to them immediately and, and, and sure enough, in both cases, they had to mistakenly hit that checkbox. So we know that we're gonna have some of those challenges. We gotta stay on top of it. We have a team from human resources, academic affairs, and a larger team in student affairs that are gonna be monitoring those. Um, and so uh, we're, we, we think that will work. We also leaving on the table the possibility of uh, contracting with Rave Mobile Safety, which is our current um, emergency alert system. They do have a COVID-19 uh, tool add-on um, and that we could consider. So we're gonna continue to speak with them, but we're happy with a Formstack platform for now. Um, a little bit about um, visitors. Uh, we have signage all over the campus, um, welcoming our students, staff and faculty and welcoming visitors if they're approved and giving them a method uh, to contact us for that type of approval. But our campus is essentially closed off to anyone else. We've made it clear in our residence halls that our commuter students, unfortunately, are not welcome to visit our students that are on campus. Um, so we're feeling good about that. Our communications and marketing department has done a terrific job in branding all of those communications. So um, we have some really uh, nice looking materials and not just a, you know, a bunch of eight and a half by 11 markered up posters. And so that's, an, that's important. And it sends a, a positive message to our community that this is, we're taking this very seriously. And I think there's a sense of pride in how we're, we're handling this. So I'm happy to report that. Um, President Collins mentioned uh, the academic calendar already. Uh, travel uh, has been greatly reduced and that has to be approved by the president if there's going to be any travel. Um, we're considering right now, for instance, our, our typical um, travel needs on the Johnson campus going to Morrisville. Uh, we will continue that, but it'll be a, a maximum of three occupants, including the driver. Um, and there'll be some other limitations as well, as well, and it will have to be scheduled and those students will have to be screened before entering. But we still feel like we can offer that service, but in a very safe way. Campus events, uh, we have some, um, uh, some great open spaces on the NVU campus. And so we are able to program a little bit on the outside. Uh, we have uh, partnered with Catamount Arts. They're doing the drive-in to stay safe program. We have a, uh, in our main parking lots, which have been hugely successful. There's a great concert on the Linden campus last night. Um, and we were able to uh, cordon off an area 
um, sort of away from the cars for some of our students that arrived on campus who already tested negative to enjoy that separate from the rest of the group. So those, that partnership continues to be amazing. We're able to have some of those things where they're safely distanced with masks on at all times. Uh, like I said, that, that part of it is going well. Uh, health screenings, the students will participate in the same program that the faculty and staff will be on a daily basis. I think I mentioned that already. All the students are being encouraged to maintain an informal contact tracing journal. Uh, they can use their own uh, template, but we're asking them to be thinking about that every day. But of course, we also have attendance tracking in classes. We know exactly when, uh, at what time they've entered the dining hall. Um, and our Sodexo partners are doing a tremendous job with not only signage, but uh, tracking the number of guests in the dining hall at any time. Um, and so I, I toured that today as, as a lot of our students are using it. The, the facility looks fantastic. I'm so happy to report that. Um, athletics and intramural programs, it's still a, an open question that we're waiting for further guidance on. Uh, obviously our, our, our student athletes and our uh, administration, athletic administration are anxious to see what the next steps are. But um, I think that we're, we're still in a holding pattern, but we do have a safe plan uh, that we're ready to um, uh, unleash is for the safe use of our SHAPE facilities, uh, but that will be for our in, internal uh, community members only. So um, we have a, a great program of telehealth, telecounseling ready to go for our students, especially those students in quarantine. And if we do get a positive case, um, those services will be available. Uh, we have uh, at least 5%, probably more um, at this point, ready for quarantine and isolation housing if necessary. We have private apartments on the Johnson campus for the isolation and at least uh, two buildings, three buildings on the Johnson, on the Linden campus for that. So um, we feel like we're ready to go. Uh, we're excited to be back. And I have to tell you, it's really energizing to have the students back with us. And that's all I have. Lynn, you're muted. Can't hear the lawnmower outside. Uh, President Collins, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think that uh, that is all I have to say for now. And I think you have a full report. I'll wait to see what the questions are at the end. Okay, of the thank program. you. Um, yes, I believe Community College of Vermont is the next one. Um, Joyce, Judy, you can. Give us your rundown, please. Okay, um, I will just start by just reminding people that um, for the fall, um, we are offering five different formats. Our courses in five different formats, um, primarily online. Some are synchronous with an online component, flex, accelerated, and then we have a hybrid model. And of the 700 classes that we're offering, only 25 are hybrid. And those are the only only those 25 classes have any on ground components. So it's a it's a pretty small number. Um, just as also as a reminder, our centers for the fall will not be open to the public and only um, faculty and students can come with appointment only. We only expect students who perhaps need to use the computer lab will be there. So we're expecting very, very few students to come into our centers, our staff for the most part, will continue working remotely as they have since March. Um, so given that there's not a lot of activity in our centers, but I do want to let people know um, some things that we have, we have put in place because for the staff who are there and for students and faculty who do come, we need the procedures in place. Um, I do want to let people know that we received a waiver from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So we um, are not, we have a waiver for testing because it's just, um, it didn't make sense. Um, they decided with the few numbers of students that we are having come in and how sporadically they're coming. Our hybrid classes, the 25 that will be meeting have a face-to-face -face component. They will meet um, about once a month, no more than four times. Um, and they, the tw those 25 classes are spread out over six to eight centers. And um, again, they'll only at the most, they'll be in face-to-face -face contact four times about once a month, Mar uh, September, October, November, and December. Um, the staff who do come to the center as we have, we put this in place in May, um, do a daily health screening. So we have, we've set up our centers. So there's one way to come in and one way to go out. 
Um, people take their temperature. Um, they check off that um, the standard things that you have to do um, that are required from the Department of Health around the Daily Health Center. For the students who are coming into the into um, uh, the center for our labs, they will be signing a student health contract. And we have also on file both the exposure and the restart plan for those very specific courses. So there's a very, um, we have been very planful. They'll be socially distanced. Um, the classes are, are, are small. And so we believe we can, um, we can manage those according to the Department of Health guidelines. Um, with that, I will stop. I will just um, give you an update. We, you know, we decided in June to move to, you know, primarily online. And I have to say it gave me great pause because I wasn't sure how our enrollment was going to look. Our enrollment is incredibly strong. Um, so we are very happy with, I think, the certainty that we provided um, to our students and to our faculty. And, um, you know, we have three more weeks of registration, but right now um, the enrollment trends are, are, are strong. So I'm happy about that. So, and I have to say, I was, it's one of those things that when you make these decisions, it causes a lot of angst. So I think I'm happy that we, we did what we did. And I should also say that um, we are about to, um, we are looking at spring. We need to make decisions about spring very soon in the next two or three weeks. And we are leaning towards doing spring just as we did fall. Um, we will let we will make an official announcement, but we are looking at all kinds of data, what other places are doing, um, particularly community colleges. And um, we just feel like we are we're going to be in a similar situation in the spring. So I will let the board know at our next meeting by the, our September meeting, we will have made a decision. So I'm happy to stop there and answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Castleton University, Jonathan. Thank you, and Chair Dickinson, I, I do strongly object to going in reverse alphabetical order. I just think that's, <laughs> who ever heard of such a thing? Uh, and I'm, I'm glad Joyce is, is thinking about the spring. I'm trying to make it past five o'clock this afternoon, so I admire her ability to be that, uh, that's impressive. Uh, I want the board to know that these four institutions have engaged in extensive collaboration, unprecedented collaboration on a daily basis, seven days a week since about the middle of May. Um, but as you've heard, CCV is online with no residence halls. NVU is in the classroom and in the residence halls. Uh, Castleton is not in the classroom, but we have a few hundred students in the residence halls. Um, so we have our differences. Despite them, I need to reiterate that we are all following the very strict guidelines issued by the governor and the health department. Um, we all have masks, in our case, green Castleton masks. Um, we all have social distancing protocols and quarantining and uh, no outside visitors in the dorms, testing, isolation, tracing, but because, because each campus is different, um, the details of implementation differ slightly from campus to campus. And I think that's how it should be, actually. Um, the state, for example, has issued core principles for how businesses should uh, reopen, but how those principles are applied differs from business to business. Uh, a drive-through fast food restaurant is not the same as an indoor furniture store, which in turn is not the same as an outdoor farmer's market. So we're different as we should be, but we all follow the core principles. Uh, we test on day one and again on day seven. So far, all the tests are negative. I think we have about 190 to 100 results still out. They'll be coming in later on this afternoon. Uh, but we are prepared to have positive tests. Um, we'll, we're gonna have approximately 350 students on campus. And if you take the generalized positivity rate of 0.6%, that means we should expect to have about two cases coming in positive. And I think everyone on this call should be prepared for positive cases. Um, um, in defense of my beloved colleague, President Moulton, uh, who had a case the other day, 
Dr. Levine repeatedly reminds us that a positive test means the system is working. We know there are people out there who are uh, asymptomatic and testing simply reveals who they are and a positive identification as with VTC means that we can now isolate them, contact trace and so forth. Um, so I just, I want to prepare us for the fact that there probably will be other positive cases. Um, I'm inclined to stop there because we're really not very different from our sister institutions. Happy to answer your questions or turn it over to our amazing Dean of Students, Dennis Pru, if you have questions about the specific details. But again, we're all following the exact same generalized principles. Any questions? We've heard from all four institutions. David. I'm curious um, from the presidents to hear how the local communities are reacting to the return of students to their communities. So I get to go first this time because that's only fair. Uh, David, as you might suspect, it's, it's split right down the middle. Uh, half of, I'm talking about Kasten and Rutland now, Half of our population very much wants and needs the students to return for obvious financial reasons. And half are very concerned about uh, irresponsible teenagers running amok on the streets of our town. And, and I'll tell you, uh, I s clearly see both sides of the issue. I think they're both right. We need them financially, and we need to make sure that uh, public health is protected. Um, but I mean, I'll show you my inbox. I mean, literally one message will say, uh, open up. And the very 10 seconds later, another equally vehement message saying, close it down. So that's Castleton and I'll uh, cede my time to my sister presidents. I'll go next, uh, if we're gonna go back into order. <laughs> I would say that, um, I would say that I concur with Jonathan that, that that's what I've read essentially, that it is a 50-50 split in terms of how the communities are viewing it. However, that said, I, I have not had any messages uh, in my box that's from the community that suggest that they are not um, happy about how we are proceeding. I think Jonathan has done an exceptional job of keeping everybody apprised as to what is going on so people feel safe. And um, so far, things are going well. Anyone else? Well, last I knew C came before V, so I'll let Joyce go next. So. Um, we, we haven't had any, any pushback from the public. I think that um, I will say our faculty and our students are pretty happy because prior to us going mostly online, um, we were getting a lot of pushback from faculty that they did not want to be in the classroom. So, um, yeah. So we, you know, we're doing essentially what we did this summer and what we did for fall. So there's not really a big, a, a big change in terms of students coming to our centers. I have spoken uh, to the Randolph town manager uh, probably a month ago just to see what he was hearing. He had absolutely no concerns. The biggest concern that he was hearing was hoping students were coming back for the economic activity. Uh, I did notify him last Friday via voicemail of our one positive case. I also notified the CEO at our local hospital just in case something goes horribly wrong. Um, but I will confess I have not talked to the Williston town manager, but I've written it down a second time to make that call. Um, and we have such a po small population in Williston that are in the res halls. Majority of the Williston students are commuters from the greater Chittenden County area. So they're living in their own homes. We can house a maximum of 50 students on campus and we're only gonna have 28. Um, and we have some rental that goes on in the community, but limited amount, but I will absolutely be in touch. I have not heard anything from them directly. Any other board members have questions? Megan. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks all for sharing this information. It's clear you've given this a lot of thought, and I know there are no easy, easy solutions to this. I just wanna confirm, I think that I heard from you all a similar approach to quarantine, and I want to confirm what I heard, 
um, and just make sure that I heard this correctly. So the, the students that are coming from out of state, from what we think of as the, the quarantine counties that Vermont has designated as areas where students need to quarantine. If I heard correctly, across our residential colleges, there's two ways that those students can integrate into the community. They can either attest that they have self-quarantined for 14 days prior to arrival, which would mean that they have not shared a room or a space or a car with 14 days prior to landing on that campus. That's one way they can enter and you have a, a process for attesting and, and signing. And I think if I, if I remember correctly, also interviewing those students to push on that a bit. The second way would be that they could come to your campus and then move into quarantine housing where they would be the only person in their dorm room, you would deliver them food um, for seven days and they could test out of that quarantine. I just wanted to check that understanding with our, our three residential colleges, if I might. This, this is uh, Dennis uh, at Castleton and I would confirm that that's accurate to what we're doing. The, uh, the option of a 14 day quarantine and then come or seven day with a negative test is what they can do at home, just to clarify that. And I guess, Dennis, a further clarification for those, we've been living this for six straight months, uh, but for those who are new, quarantining has a different definition than isolating. So quarantining is exactly what Trustee Kluver said it is. When students who are coming to campus the first time are quarantined for 14 days or seven days followed by a negative test. Mm -hmm. Isolation is what you do after someone tests positive, and it's a more stringent form of quarantining. So I, I, I don't mean to fault you. Maybe you all knew that, but it, it took me a few weeks to to understand the difference, and that is the difference. Thank you. The, the other uh, nuance to, to uh, your question is that um, the state guidelines does allow someone to come by a private car with their supposedly family um, and with a uh, few stops and come to campus. So you mentioned uh, by themselves in a car, um, that, that's not completely accurate. The state does allow them to come by car uh, with uh, infrequent stops. I, um, I can confirm that is true for Vermont Tech. I'm sorry, Jason Enzer isn't here, but we have an incident response team scheduled at the exact same time uh, every Monday at three, and he's chairing that because we've got some things we've, we've got to sort out still. Um, the, and I agree with everything that's been said, and thank you for the clar clarification, President Spiro. I will say that the health department has told our, us that our quarantine students um, who have not, who have gotten a negative test can leave their dorm, can go outside and be on campus. They cannot leave campus. They cannot congregate. Whereas our quarantine students who are on the same floor as the positive test cannot leave their room. Um, they must remain in the room. And I, and I will say that it's causing some concerns. Um, we have heard from a couple parents of students who have anxiety and depression issues that um, treat them in part by outside activity and, and exercise and, and fresh air. And you can imagine that they're not doing really well in this circumstance. So we're in the process of actually, that's one of the things Jason's talking about is, might there be circumstances in which that could change under supervision? And then we would seek approval from the Vermont Department of Health for whatever plan that finally looks like. Uh, it's very tricky, but yes, the isolated student is exactly that. Isolated, not leaving the room, food being brought in, refrigerator and microwave to accommodate his food needs. Um, so that, that seems to be working. Yeah, I can also confirm that for NVU, uh, Megan, that is uh, what's happening. And, and I think you mentioned the interview process. That is our last step at the drive through check-in, taking them through a rather, uh, in some cases, uh, rigorous interview uh, to test uh, them a little bit. And so we definitely uh, did end up with a few extra quarantine students in that case. And they are asking to get outside. Uh, we're hoping we can work out some kind of solution. Um, looks like the rain clouds are coming over us, though, so maybe they're not missing too much sunshine, but um, that has definitely been a struggle for them. No one else have a question? Go ahead, Linda. Um, and Michael. Yes, I know you're um, all working a lot with the Department of Health following the guidelines. Um, what, I, what I didn't, and I fully... Yeah, as many of you said, that there will be positive 
cases and that many of them can just be isolated and we'll get over it. What I haven't heard, and I expect it's because Department of Health will be doing a lot of contact tracing and be a large part of the decision, is have you folks in your plans established the threshold at which you'd have to consider you'd have to consider closing like how many cases that kind of thing or is that you know again something that really is depending on facts working with the department of health and looking at all those statistics and things Anyone? Um, I can go first on that one, if that's okay. Um, sure. So your question is a timely one. We, in fact, our emergency management team is meeting tomorrow at this time mm -hmm. to uh, finalize our plans. Uh, but I can tell you in general, oh, it did just start raining. Uh, if you don't know, presidents and deans pray for rain the first week of class, because it means the socializing <laughs> is at a minimum. So that's just great news. Uh, it's not just one statistic. It's a whole uh, categories of metrics that must be consulted. Clearly, how many positive cases do we have? Um, and I think you could, we haven't finalized, we'll do this tomorrow, but I think fewer than 10, okay. More than that, then um, we need to start getting serious uh, about our plans. Uh, another metric is what percentage of tests are positive if it turns out to be greater than 5%, or if it's increasing over a seven-day period, then uh, that's another warning flag. Um, another is, what is the capacity of our quarantine and isolation facilities? Um, so do we have fewer than seven days remaining uh, until um, uh, our capacity reaches zero? That's of interest. Uh, how quickly is our testing capacity going to be overwhelmed? Uh, if we have fewer than seven days remaining until testing capacity is maxed out, well then uh, that's another signal. Um, if the time to process tests starts exceeding 48 hours, uh, then that will be of concern. Do we have sufficient uh, PPE capacity? Uh, we have concerns about our, our supply lines uh, for the next 15 weeks. So um, if we have fewer than seven days in the pipeline, then um, before our PPE is depleted, we'll take that in, into consideration. So it's not one metric, it's all those combined. Uh, but this is a work in progress because we've been living in the day and we're now pivoting to looking to the future. It's a great question. I'll know more tomorrow for Castleton. Right. Well, and, and I understand that it, cha it changes. I've heard Dr. Levine answer that, that question somewhat in response to the state as a whole. I'm not surprised that your answer rather reflects that answer just on a different scale. Anyone else? Pat? Thank you, Jonathan, for summing that up so well, because it's very similar to what we are. And we will be looking for the Department of Health to really advise us on this, but it really relates more to our capacity. Um, we are required to uh, have isolation for up to 5% of our residential student body. If we have that many students in isolation who are actually sick, that will certainly trigger our thinking. And we will certainly then look at, at pivoting. Um, but we are learning that the positive cases, we shouldn't panic about, but the first time we get someone who's actually symptomatic, um, has concerns and we have to isolate them, uh, that would be what would trigger. And we also have a requirement that every student come with a plan to return home should they get sick. And so the plan is to send them home when they're sick. Um, but the isolation is for those students who may live out of state that won't be able to get on an airplane or on a bus or on a train and how long will it take for a family member to come and pick he or she up? So very similar to Castleton, not one metric. It would have to be judged based on a lot of factors. Um, and Jonathan's absolutely right. Um, we're very fortunate to have an, uh, what we hope is an adequate supply of PPE, um, but one can never tell. 
I think uh, for NVU, I would, I would respond similarly to the presidents that have gone before me. One thing I've been really happy about is the relationship that we have with the Department of Health. It's not like you're just sitting out here alone doing your own thing. You know, it's like we're a team in Vermont. We all kind of want the same end goal and we're all working at the same thing. And I think Pat Moulton uh, with her recent experience and as she shared, you know, when she called, I mean, I, there's a feeling for all of us that we're, we're very concerned. You know, we don't want to have the cases or, or the upticks or the, you know, we don't want to skew the, the data and we don't want to have our communities in danger, right? We're all worried about that. But what they're telling us is, you know, we're here for you, okay? This is normal. This is what's going to happen in a pandemic. Uh, and we have a process and we can assist you through it. So it, I'm trying to look at it as, you know, this isn't just NVU in isolation. We are a system, we have that. We have all of the good thinking of all of the presidents and all of the community and the trustees and everybody who makes up the Vermont State Colleges. But we also have the Department of Health. We've been working with UVM. We've been working with Copley Hospital. We've been working, you know, and if these people can't assist us to make an appropriate decision, I don't know who can. So. I'll stop there. Michael, I think you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, everybody, for um, participating this uh, afternoon. So just wanted to reiterate the point. A couple of points have been made. One, I mean, I, we certainly can anticipate seeing cases on our campuses, as, as we said. I mean, People coming from Vermont, students coming from Vermont might be less likely given our low disease prevalence in the state, but certainly the disease is still in Vermont, so that's a possibility. But again, students coming from um, places outside of the state with a higher disease prevalence, all the more likely that the robust testing that's going on is going to pick up um, cases in our campuses. And how we respond to those cases um, is really a critical importance. I was glad to hear Jonathan mention some of the things that they're thinking about in terms of metrics. I think just one to point out, um, to keep a close eye on is the turnaround time on testing. I think that one's critical because if you, if you, you know, Vermont's been very lucky. We've had a very steady turnaround time and that's allowed the Department of Health to get quickly to all the contacts um, and manage the contact tracing before, you know, um, someone that might've had three contacts if the test is delayed five or six, seven days, that might be 15, 20 contacts, and it just becomes much more difficult to isolate and contain. Um, so certainly uh, keeping an eye on that. Um, the question I had, and I heard Pat say 5% um, for isolation uh, rooms or facilities. I was just wondering how many, uh, what was the isolation capacity for each of the campuses and then secondly, I was wondering who is doing the contact tracing for the institutions? Is it the Department of Health like they would with any other positive um, case or it, are the universities helping or taking the lead in that in some way? So you're absolutely correct. The, the, the state made in essence a deal with us, which is that we will pay for the testing, but they will come in the Department of Health and do the contact tracing. And um, uh, I can only echo what Elaine said. It's just a pleasure working with them. They, they, they. I mean, as as Pat can tell you, they sweep in and do exactly what they told us they were going to do. So that's been wonderful. Um, you asked about the capacity for um, was um, yeah, how many isolation? Uh, I, I think it's well, it's mandated by the state, which is five percent. That's in the governor's guidelines, which for us I think is a hundred beds. But Dean Prue, can you correct me if I'm wrong, please? Our 5% originally taken on our um, uh, normal occupancy was 55 beds, uh, which is what we took offline. Uh, initially, we've now doubled that, uh, actually doubled that plus 30. So um, we have three actually halls, depending on the profile, that we can use for quarantining. Um, and so well well beyond the 5% expectation. Right. So, that's, so over the 5%. Great. We're back. Yeah, at NVU, we have uh, at least three full buildings available, plus uh, campus apartments, um, and then a smaller uh, a building that was um, uh, uh, turned into a residence hall from a house years ago. So we have um, a pretty large capacity for quarantine and isolation. And that's on both campuses? That's correct. Right. Um, we have 
capacity to isolate a lot more students than we're going to need to. Um, we have really two and a half empty res halls when we get finished with all the students who are here for the semester and um, the lab weeks. We, anticip we, we anticipate approximately 100 during the semester, so that's five rooms here in Williston during lab weeks that could grow by as much as 60. So um, we would, we've got plenty of rooms. We're essentially holding old dorm as our, um, as our isolation facility. Williston's a little more challenging because we don't really have a lot of res hall space. So we're, we can max out at approximately four, three to four students who could, would have to isolate. Um, and then we're gonna be challenged. So, uh, but here at the moment we have, we meet that 5% and then some at Williston, but, um, and we're unsure still exactly how many students are coming to Williston for lab weeks. I know it's gonna be a small number. We're gonna have those numbers by the end of this week uh, as students sign up for residence capacity in, in, uh, during those lab weeks. But as I said, roughly oh, 60 plus percent of the, or 70% of the students in Williston are commuters. So um, we expect that if they are having symptoms, they're just gonna stay home. And um, that's, so we hope that the three to four spaces we have will be adequate in Williston. I just wanted to comment on the second part of your question around contact tracing. Oh, yeah. uh, what I've been sharing with the community here uh, is that uh, we view the Department of Health as the incident commander. Uh, we will partner with them, but we will be prepared to, um, with a lot of information about any particular student, staff, or faculty member and where they've been and what close contacts they have. So we'll be ready with that information, but we expect them to take the lead uh, and guide us through that process. Yeah, All right, geez. thank you. Apologies for interrupting Jonathan um, before, but yes, the department's doing contact tracing us. We are encouraging all our uh, employees and students to keep uh, contact journals. Um, and we, at our, our case Friday, we did do some additional intel with others on campus who might know where that student had been and who they may have come in contact with. So we anticipate we'll be assisting in that tracing. Can Karen, you have a question. You're being, you're muted. Yes, thank you. And thank you everyone. Again, I'm proud to be part of this group of people. Um, I, I just need to be fresh in my mind. I, I'm not sure I got all the numbers. I'd like to know from each of the presidents, the number of students we will have in residence halls um, this semester, number one. And number two, um, I heard um, President Moulton refer to an agreement by students in advance to go home if they have symptoms or are sick. And I didn't hear the other presidents say that. I'm wondering if I should just take that for granted or if that's something that is done or, or it, it should be done. I think for NVU, uh, it depends on the case. If it's uh, uh, that we could have a case where a student, you know, um, a Vermont student, let's take who lives, you know, 20 miles from home, goes home for a weekend and and uh, has developed some symptoms and decides to get tested. I mean, that's a case where they're going to be home and they're not going to be allowed back on campus. But we also have students coming from a fair distance and uh, it wouldn't be, uh, we'll need to wait and see what the circumstances are for them to be able to travel safely without uh, potentially putting someone else in harm's way. So I think it's going to be case by case uh, for us. And if they're here, they're going to stay here until we get some guidance that suggests otherwise. Yeah, the presidents. I'll just, to your, to your first question, um, Karen, we anticipate 100 students here all summer in Randolph Center and or all semester in Randolph Center and 28 all semester in Williston. We currently have 42 on campus. So more will be Vermonters who want to live um, on in residence. I'm unsure of the number for here for the lab weeks. We anticipate that might be as, as much as an additional 40 to 50, but we will have those numbers by the end of the week. Um, and same with the number of lab students in, uh, in Williston. And um, yes, we, we are asking students to have a go home plan, but I mean, 
as Jonathan at Davis explained, I mean, if there's some extraordinary circumstance that that student can't go home for whatever reason, um, we'll figure out how to accommodate here. Or if that student simply cannot isolate at home or a student can't go home because they've got people at home that might be sick, but did not test or that maybe are sicker, but we'll, we'll take, take it case by case. But generally, generally we want students to go home if they are not well. I want to weigh in too on um, the first part of your question in terms of how many students are we expecting, uh, Trustee Luno, we have 300 expected at each campus. At Thank you. Um, we have room in the residence halls for 1,050 students approximately. We are expecting uh, 300 to 350. The, uh, the last day and time to move in was two minutes ago. So I'll know more uh, this evening about what our numbers are. Um, uh, so it would be around 300 to 350 with the caveat, as always, that uh, a lot depends on the fate of athletics, um, which as some of you know, is still, uh, is still waiting for the governor to issue his guidelines. Um, so maybe 300 on campus. And we're, we're teaching online, so all the rest are taking classes online. Thank you. I have a question about the, um, for the president's, I'm sorry, Bill, you go first. Okay, well, I'll go first. I wanna know what happens if there's a, a disciplinary issue, uh, what are the plans if kids are having large parties, uh, things that are maybe not safe, not within the guidelines. Uh, are we going to be tolerant or are we going to crack down on it? Uh, so at Castleton, we have our normal disciplinary procedures, uh, which are still in effect and were <clears throat> devised to accommodate a situation like this. And given that the whole world is watching, you might be able to guess on which uh, side of the pendulum we intend to land regarding uh, leniency versus severity. Anyone else? Go ahead, Pat. Um, very similar. We have uh, amended our code of conduct, student code of conduct, to include language around adherence to these types of protocols. Um, the, but the usual uh, behavioral process will ensue should there be a problem with either someone not wearing a mask uh, regularly or uh, not participate in uh, practicing safe so social distancing, et cetera. Faculty are allowed to um, keep them out of class for the moment until they can feel it, realize they have to do what they have to do. They will be reported, will follow the necessary disciplinary pro process. The only real problem comes is, is when they do something off campus. Um, like in the, the, we have one, um, one apartment building we affectionately refer to as the soccer house that tends to be where the soccer players are and have soccer parties and um, and they are not on campus, but if they are our students, they are all subject to the code of conduct and therefore the disciplinary process that would ensue. And we fully intend to make an example of the first few to set the tone. Um, similarly with employees who may not wish to comply, we will make an example um, because we feel it's important to make that statement up front that we're not kidding and we are taking this extremely seriously because it's literally a life or death matter. Thank you. How about NVU? Uh, the same. We are, uh, I, you've heard Jonathan talk about our health pledge. So what I'm happy about is that we have clearly stated in writing up front that any deviation from the uh, protocols that we've described in all of our processes will we will have disciplinary action. And I think that um, th the timing is the importance here. Uh, this is something that as soon as we find out that uh, somebody has broken protocol, it's really important to get up and very quickly in front of the matter and resolve it. Uh, I was very happy during the summer when we had a breach, we had a breach, we had something occur as Pat was mentioning off campus, which is a little bit harder to uh, learn. About. But I was really excited to see that students were the ones that reported the other students because they were concerned that uh, they didn't want anybody to violate 
the, the kind of contracts and pledges that they had made and they wanted to make sure that everybody in their community was safe. So that's what happened. Okay, good. Bill, you had a question. Unmute. Yes. Um, perhaps this has been mentioned and I missed it, but uh, what are the, are there restrictions or what are the protocols for students who are now here, they're on the residential campuses and they wish to socialize in the local community. What are the, are there, I mean, you know, let, let's go get a pizza. Let's go, let's go do whatever. Uh, what, what is, what are the expectations with regard to students in residence on campuses uh, being part of the community more broadly and what expectations follow them into the community? Pat, I unmuted first, but you, darn it, raised your hand first, so you get to go. Um, I was going to say something about age before beauty, but I, I, I'll leave that aside. So um, you're probably younger than I am, Jonathan. Um, we, after the 14-day quarantine period, and essentially students become like a family pod, um, assuming no one's ill, they've mm -hmm. completed their tests, they're answering all the, the necessary questions, they're doing the daily temperature checks, so they can be out in the community. We have in our, um, our uh, promise, our pledge, the health pledge, that we're asking them to not travel further than 10 miles from campus, to not go away on weekends, to not go to any major cities, um, and we're counting on them to live by that. But yeah, if they wanna go down and get a pizza, the same public rules apply. You have to wear a mask, you can't socially distance. Um, technically, you can't ride in the same car. Um, to go get the pizza. Uh, so it, the, there will be some tricks to how they do all this, but you know, they will be able to be out and about to the extent um, they wish, but they need to be practicing all the same protocols. Jonathan. Uh, thank you. I would note that um, student testing is not required by the CDC. Um, mm -hmm. It is required by our governor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we test on day one, we test on day seven, that's followed by surveillance testing. But, but bear in mind that uh, after 14 days, uh, our students are residents of Vermont. And, and as far as we're concerned, have all the rights and privileges thereof. And since one of the reasons why we're allowing students in the residence halls is to bolster the local economy, um, we do allow them to wander off our campus. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'll stop there. So the answer, Bill, is yes, they, they are allowed off campus. Thank you. Well, well, my question was prompted in part by uh, some community members eager for students to come back because of the financial impact on the community, and that includes you know people who for, were their patrons, and and so I wanted to just make sure I understood what the what the plan and protocols are uh, because I would think that the community also has an expectation that students will uh, for, I mean, because your community each community is has members who are, some who are concerned that the students are back and others who are perhaps delighted that the students are back. Uh, it puts additional expectation that students actually follow at least the protocols that are expected. And so. Oh, you betcha. And I happen to know for a fact that members of our local community are out there with cameras eager to catch our students. Right. Not and, and yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm just going to comment quickly for NVU that sure. after the students who are not required to quarantine clear their first test with a negative result, they are allowed to leave campus. Our pledge talks about following the cross state uh, travel guidelines. Um, and uh, I'll just go back to a quick comment from President Collins earlier that mentioned that um, our students are, are watching as well. They're watching each other. Um, and we have uh, received some reports of behavior. Uh, this happened in the spring, the incident that President Collins was referring to. So long before even the pledge, our students recognize the importance of, of compliance and staying safe, uh, but they are allowed to travel into the community. The quarantine students are stuck where they are inside uh, until the second negative test, but um, they'll be out there soon enough. Okay, are there any more board members with questions? Anything else the presidents wanna say? Okay, if David, not, I, David, Linda, I think David has a question. Oh, David, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I just wanted to address, um, you know, we've, we've covered students. I think we've covered um, instruction, but we haven't really talked too much about support staff and all of the other important players on our campuses and, you know, whether, uh, you know, I think the governor's um, guidance with regards to returning to work in offices and so on and so forth is still leaning towards if you can work from home, you should continue to do that. And I'm just wondering how that's going to look like um, on the campuses, understanding that, uh, you know, face-to-face -face service in some cases, including counseling, is probably pretty important. Um, the advisor relationship and so on and so forth. Anyone? Pat. <laughs> Sorry to be always jumping in front, Jonathan. I, I, I'm feeling the power of going first. Um, <clears throat> so the to answer your question, David, um, yes, all the governor's protocols regarding return to work are still in place. And um, we, as I mentioned, we've been um, doing the temperature check on everyone coming to campus this summer, but we're ending that when classes start for the self-attestation. We are not planning on bringing most of our employees back on campus. We have essential services that ha can only be performed here, facility staff, um, business office, you know, student accounts, student affairs, et cetera. But there's a whole lot of back office employees too who can remain working from home. In fact, as part of our transformation planning, we're expecting we're to make this fairly permanent and, and provide options for work from home. We're updating our policy. We're looking at uh, different technology purchases to enable, enable folks to work at home in a better situation than we had to throw together last spring. Um, the exact number of employees, I mean, most of our non-faculty um, with the exception of those essential services that must be performed here, I expect we'll stay at home. We've done surveys of our employees, found out that in most cases, they're pretty happy with it. Um, but we are planning obviously for staggered schedules, opportunities for folks to come in, hotel type office space versus permanent assigned single offices in an effort to reduce um, our footprint also. Um, we are not requiring them to get tested, but we're encouraging and we are absolutely telling any employee who is health compromised or lives with someone who's health compromised to stay working at home. Uh, and that includes faculty who can teach from home. We're buying a fair amount of technology, not just for classrooms, but even to enable those types of faculty um, to have that to conduct their work from home. In view. So um, similar to BTC, uh, we have a, a protocol where high risk people or uh, people who live with other people who are at high risk for COVID uh, can opt to work from home. For essential employees, we have tried a variety of techniques. One thing is that uh, we have purchased, I think I've shared this before, a few outside tent areas so that um, people can move outside where they have uh, the fresh air and where they have a, a huge ability to distance uh, from others. So that is available to do their work. We have also encouraged that uh, advising be done if necessary uh, through the computer and through technology because um, that's just it, it just makes good sense so we're trying to accommodate as much as possible uh, i think people are coming up with really good solutions as to how to meet um, students we're working out processes in terms of you know how people are coming into buildings and then how they are dispersing to meet with other uh, people within buildings for uh, certain services so that is, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're taking that very seriously just as much as we're taking the students, the health of our students and everyone else uh, into consideration. But definitely, um, you know, keeping an eye on how that's going to all work out. But that's, that's uh, our plan thus far. Kesselden. 
And uh, I think we're the exact same as CCV, maybe, in the sense that uh, we're teaching remotely, so our faculty aren't really part of this equation. Our staff, as someone said a few minutes ago, we need our staff here to serve our students. That's what we're about. Um, with the exception of some staff who uh, might need accommodations, our staff are coming to campus. The very first thing they do when they walk in the building is they take their temperature uh, and they attest daily by signature that they are complying with the governor's guidelines. Um, so it's very similar. And I, as I said, I think CCV has the exact same protocol. Well, Judy, what, what I do when I go into, if I go to the office as a Vermonter, I have to do that to go into my, go into the office. Yeah. What Jonathan described is, yes, that's what we're, we're doing. Um, we have, you can only enter all of our centers through one door. Mm -hmm. And you have to take the temperature, you have to sign a form that says, yes, I don't have any of these symptoms. And we do that every day. And at that table, we also have masks. So if people need a mask and they've forgotten it, they can take one. We have um, sanit hand sanitizer and we have um, gloves and we <laughs> Gloves that this morning, we had a bear in Montpelier. We all had to put on our gloves and go outside and pick up. He, we actually had him on video. This morning, he got into our dumpster. He was quite clever. And then he pulled all the garbage out and, and made a path right up the hill, right into the woods. Hmm. So, so the gloves came in very handy. <laughs> Anyone else? Speak up. Okay, we have a question uh, from Beth, Beth Walsh. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Beth Walsh. I work as the Director of Career Development at NVU Johnson and serve as the President of the Vermont State Colleges United Professionals. Uh, Trustee Silverman, I really appreciated you asking about staff. We are often forgotten in the list of students and faculty. Um, and so everybody seems to be doing things a little bit differently. You have a lot of things in common, um, but I'm wondering how you decided not to test staff and faculty if they're gonna be on your campus, um, since it's been shown that that really does help us have control over outbreaks and such. I've appreciated being, being able to test at NVU Johnson, um, and I like the plan of testing our faculty and staff. And I know it sets an example for students as well, because I know that we all have faculty and staff on our campuses that honestly think this is a hoax, that it's not to be taken seriously. And I worry about that, um, especially if they're supervising other people on our campuses. So I'm just curious as to how that decision was made not to test faculty and staff. Okay, some president want to address that issue? Pat Moulton. I was waiting for you, Jonathan. Um, we made that decision primarily because we're having difficulty finding a capacity to do the testing uh, from such a large number of folks. Um, and also the fact that our faculty and staff come from Vermont predominantly. Uh, anyone who might live out of state in a yellow or red county, it's a different story. Also the fact that we're not anticipating a lot more additional staff, faculty aside for a moment, on campus this semester that haven't been coming to campus all summer um, in staggered schedules and having their temperature checked. We are requiring all employees to do the self-attestation through Castle Branch every morning. So we know their temperature and they're taking their, their um, the, answering the questions. But this was felt that the and the risk seems quite low, mostly for faculty staff, given that they are from Vermont, aren't from yellow or red counties, and um, have been coming here a fair amount most of the summer. So that's why we decided we're still debating um, whether or not that's going to have to change. But we don't have guidance that there's no guidance now that all employees must be tested prior to coming to work. So that's where we landed on that, Beth. Oh, that means it's my turn. Thank you, Beth. 
It's a great, great question. I appreciate, I deeply appreciate your, uh, in my view, correct attitude about, about testing. For Kasten, the short and easy answer is uh, because we're following the governor's guidelines and the governor said, test students and period. So that's what we're doing. Um, I would just add, there's another mm, tangential reason, which is that um, no one in Vermont is testing everyone who walks into the local grocery store or the local car dealer. And so I'm not testing everyone who walks into my uh, administration building. Uh, but if the governor requires it, you bet you will do it. So Beth, are you the person for internships at NVU? No. <laughs> um, Ellen Hill recently left to become the um, the executive director at uh, United Way in Lamoille County. And she had, was working 0.415 um, because I am allowed 50% reduction in workload to serve as president of the union, which I expect is gonna be used up quite a bit this year. Um, I have not volunteered to take that on. So our faculty and our provost's office are taking that. But I will, I will post internships for you on our, on our job board. I will help students with their resumes and I'll encourage them to do at least one or two internships. So I'm still the cheerleader, I'm just not the coach. Well, I, I appreciate that. We're prepared to welcome a intern uh, this, uh, this coming semester uh, in any event already. So we're looking forward to having her in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Is there anyone else with any questions or any comments? Well, seeing none, um, I'm going to ask Sophia, she has a parting word for us. So, Lynn, can I jump David, in and ask a question? Sure, a go right ahead, David. Yes, please. So a couple, couple of things. First of all, so I think I just heard Beth say, that there are people in higher education that think the coronavirus is a hoax. Mm. That's a real that's a real disconnect for me, I have to say. But anyway, I, I wanted to congratulate all the campuses. You've obviously really worked hard, and actually, I'm not surprised because a lot of smart people working towards a common goal uh, produce good results. I also think we have to count on some good luck, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Michael's the guru for the good luck. <laughs> yeah, <it's Tisha>. so, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to echo. Just wanted to echo some of what David just said. I, I think um, you know each of the campuses has responded in a way that is um, appropriate for their circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, the more that more information that we've been provided as a board, the more materials that we've been able to look through, the more discussion we've been able to have. I think the more confidence that um, we gain that the institutions are, are really methodically planning this out that um, again, you cannot control whether you're gonna have a student with the virus come to campus. It's really out of our control. All we can control is that we find that quickly, we do all the um, contact tracing, the isolation, and that we have the capacity to do that, which you all have done. So that's really um, key. And then I think as we go throughout the semester, Certainly, how do you make sure that, you know, that sort of compliance stays there and, and, and is high? And, and, uh, and I know the local communities will be concerned about that as well. Um, but it will be um, it will be a uh, it'll certainly be you know, something we have to. I'm sure we'll be having a lot more discussion about it as the as the semester goes on. But everyone has demonstrated that they're off to a good start. Yes, thank you. Your yeah, see complacency is not our friend that we have to make sure the students don't become complacent as well as the rest of us. So, but thank you. You sound like you put together very thoughtful and good plans. And uh, I hope we have very few positive tests. Sophie, do you have anything you wanna add? I just have one other piece of other business, which was we didn't get a, a decision um, on Wednesday about whether we would add a, a regular board meeting in November on November 4th. Um, we did talk about doing some more 
um, shorter, more frequent meetings, but this was more just a regular meeting between our September retreat and our December, early December meeting. That seemed like a very long time to go mm -hmm. without touching base with you. So I just wanted to check if um, if we could get a vote on uh, adding a board meeting on November 4th. I would suggest, I would suggest that we um, just plan to do that. Okay, that sounds, is that something that's everyone agrees on? Yes, I okay. agree. I anticipate we'll probably have some more board meetings in addition, but just to, to at least get a regular, another regular one on the calendar just seemed like a yes. good idea. Yes, that sounds good. Thank you, Bill. Anyone, so anything I, else? Go ahead, Bill. Well, I'm just, I didn't, just on, on that note, it's a minor thing, but uh, the, a reminder to other trustees that the legislature is reconvening on August 26th. Uh, we expect to go through the month of September and so the retreat is scheduled for two days during the month of September, and it's going to be at a time when, frankly, uh, it may be difficult given the number of things that are going to be coming to a head at the end of September. Uh, we just need to be, you need to be aware that some of us may not be able to fully participate. Maybe we can have a discussion with the speaker about that. <laughs> well. <laughs> Give us maybe, a break. Maybe we should have some discussion with the board. About <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. no, we don't need to take more time now publicly about this, but I, I meant to mention it previously. Yeah. Well, I know in the past during the, you know, normally the only meeting we have that's during the legislative session is the March meeting. And we normally do that on a, on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Who, so, who, knew, who knew September was going to be in the middle of the legislative session? Yeah. Right. So we can we can we can talk about that and just check on availability because obviously right. we it's important that we get as many folks as we can um, to attend. Look, but okay. There are competing if, interests. If, I'll just mention if you move it later, then you get into heavy audit season for me. So <laughs> but I'm only one versus a handful of legislators. Okay. Yeah. Lynn, thank you for uh, again for facilita facilitating this. Oh, thank you. I kept it to an hour and a half. That was my goal. <laughs> Good thank job. you, everybody, for you know being part of this. Go ahead, Joyce. <laughs> I think she's just waving goodbye. <laughs> just, I I'm just waving goodbye to people. Okay. Well, we need a motion to. We're not going to take any action on these on these plans. I think we've all heard a lot, and I think we've had had a lot of our questions answered. Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Any any other further discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor of uh, adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Well, thank you very much all for coming, and we appreciate your um, your attention and, and really good work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye all. Thanks everyone.